UX consulting, projects, and training. Contact us for a free consultation. Well, hello, everybody. How are you? Uh, please tell me in the comments. Today is Monday, May 11th, 2020. This is Debbie Levitt from Delta CX. How are you? I'm okay, other than I was totally eaten by bugs this weekend, so I have uh, constellations on my face. Uh, if you're listening uh, on iTunes, uh, Spotify, or Google Play, you didn't see this, and that's good. Um, so today, we're going to be joined by the always fantastic Darren Hood for a conversation about the conflicts we're seeing between UX juniors and people looking to enter into the UX field and UX seniors or higher. There's definitely some battles and some fighting and some disrespect going in all directions and we want to try to take a look at this. So we are live. I would love to see your comments and questions in uh, both LinkedIn and YouTube. I am monitoring both. And now we're going to flip over to Darren who's going to introduce himself. Darren, who the heck, I got to change it to your name. Who the heck are you? <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Darren Hood uh, speaking to you today from Southfield, Michigan, right outside of Detroit. Uh, and just a little bit about me. Uh, I have, I like to split this, so I might describe this a little bit differently than you're used to. Uh, I have 16 years of full time experience working in the UX arena, and I have a total of 24 years working in UX because I began as a freelance web designer where I was applying UX skill and I transitioned into UX from being an instructional designer, which some of you know as a trainer, uh, but I also was applying UX principles when I was working in that arena as well. Uh, I currently work at a large company in the Detroit, Michigan area where I serve as a senior UX designer. I also serve as an adjunct professor in Kent State University's master's UX design program. And I serve as an adjunct professor for Lawrence Technological University in Southfield, Michigan as well. So just a little bit about me to get us started. Right. So hypothetically, you might know a few things about UX and be somewhat senior. <laughs> yes. Just checking. Yeah, just well, because it's relevant to the conversation. <laughs> just checking. Um, yeah. Now, I have to apologize. I'm looking at my system here, and it looks like, once again, LinkedIn has not notified people that I am live today. So I'm not too sure uh, why LinkedIn is having that problem. I can try to contact tech support, but the last time I contacted tech support about that, they wrote me back a week later. So this is why I strongly suggest to people who might be watching this on the archive, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, it's called Delta CX, and you can get there through a redirect deltacx.tv. Please subscribe there. YouTube is excellent about telling people that we're live. Uh, I'm not too sure why LinkedIn uh, doesn't do it, but I also have no control over that. Um, so Darren, just to quickly add to what you were saying, and let's get my face on here. I forgot that I'm not on here. Hello. Um, so uh, my story is somewhat similar to yours, except I didn't pursue all the graduate uh, degrees. Uh, I started out in web design, except I'm a terrible artist, and so I was kind of a website strategist and, and layout person, and um, then eventually trans, uh, transitioned into more traditional UX. So I've also been doing this in one form or another for over 20 years. So I think we have some, some parallels there. And I would yes. say also you and I are pretty outspoken about UX and about the practice and the profession and trying to maintain and improve the quality of it. And and that can that, that can get us you know into some conflicts with some people. Not all of the peeps always love us. But let's talk about some of the conflicts we're seeing with UX juniors and those who are uh, uh, would love to uh, get into the UX profession. So they might be in boot camps now yes. or self studying now or just graduating. And I know that we've noticed that um, that there there might be a bit of ageism there. Like, uh, oh, who are these seniors? Man, they're from Debbie and Darren are from like the '90s. I wasn't even born in the '90s. You know, uh, well, who are these dinosaurs that that are, are are going to you know tell me how UX is done? You know, I studied, I read articles, I took a course, I I saw how UX is done, and these people are just old fashioned. Are you hearing stuff like that? I have literally been called a dinosaur before in a passive aggressive way. It wasn't directed at me personally. It was just said about people in our arena. And I happen to be part of that meeting 
where it was said. They didn't say that I was a dinosaur because they saw me do something reflective of a dinosaur. They simply, this is where the word conflict comes up in our title today. They were, they brought up dinosaur simply to vault themselves forward in an attempt to be accepted. Hence comes the, the issue of conflict. There is nothing dinosaurish about people who have been practicing you for a long time. As a matter of fact, a real UX practitioner changes over time. We shift and we mold and, and engaging from a continued education perspective is a standard practice of a seasoned UX professional. I was working at a large digital agency when the iPhone came out. So guess what? We had to shift what we were doing and we had to look at our heuristics from a different angle because we were trying to, to, to account for a new form factor. So we shifted. Tablets came out. I had to design strictly for a tablet experience over the course of my career. I had to shift. We dealt with interactive TV. We had to shift. And so without going step by step through all the different nuances and the different form factors that have come along over the years, we shift, we change. So quite frankly, there is no such thing as a dinosaur, not when it comes down to real practitioners. So when somebody brings up the word dinosaur from an accusatory perspective or trying to label old practitioners, whether we like it or not, and I know somebody's not going to like this, that person is, is actually highlighting the bias. They are highlight, highlighting a desire, a willingness to engage in conflict when conflict actually should not exist between UX professionals at all. So yeah, we don't the, need, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, we don't call people who are coming, we don't have some kind of derogatory term that we use for people that just came into UX. Why is there a derogatory term for people who've been around for a while? And, and, and interestingly, those of us who've been around for a while, although we might not like everything that a lot of the people who are, are referred to as elite UX have done over the recent years, you still appreciate things that people have brought to the table. We know what people have done. We know the price they paid. And everything that we have done and everything we're doing today is built upon what people who came along before us, what they did, the foundations they laid, the practices they laid out, the, the, the terms. How dare you speak evil of a Jesse James Garrett? How dare Assuming you? you've heard who he is. <laughs> Exactly. Why would somebody not be concerned about who Alan Cooper is? Or You've Don got Norman. to be downright. Yeah, Don Norman. Why would you? Susan Lineshank is an absolute treasure. Is she a dinosaur too? I think not. These people still present things that help to shape who we are. And when we come across a different form factor or a different need, different need based on the research that we're doing on a particular project, then we should have enough of the wherewithal to shift based on what that need is. But there are no dinosaurs. Yeah, and an another thing that I remind people is if so much you see juniors posting or private messaging saying, I really wish I had a mentor. I wish I had a mentor. Well, if you think about it, who do you want to mentor you? <laughs> the person who graduated the boot camp six months ago, who is like two seconds ahead of you in your career path? Hypothetically, you're looking for a senior level or higher to mentor you, someone who has experience in the industry, who's maybe yes. had one or more jobs in the past X year who is currently practicing UX now, that is obviously an ideal yeah. mentor or coach. So there's this weird kind of thing where it's like, ew, old people, we don't want them working with us, but man, I sure hope they teach me everything I don't know for free. <laughs> exactly. And so there, therein lies the hypocrisy that is a part of, again, whether we like it or not, it's, it's, it's the truth. There's a hypocrisy that is intermingled, I find in my observations and in speaking with a lot of other people, there's a hypocrisy that's that's intermingling with the what we would hope would be the maturation of the UX discipline. Instead, and I love how someone said in a, in a talk that I was part of last week, as a discipline, we're regressing. And part of the reason for that regression is this conflict. Yeah. Is this conflict. If you're, if you're again, pointing at boot camps, which I do a lot of, but pointing at boot camps, if your boot camp instructor 
graduated from your boot camp or another boot camp six months or a year ago, as I see very often, now that's not all the time. Some boot camp instructors are highly qualified, but unfortunately, many are recent graduates of that or another boot camp. And so, um, if the message is, well, gee, someone who just learned this now can teach me, then you must look at, at, at Debbie and Darren and go, holy cats, what a relic. The example that I use is, um, yeah, I was telling you before we started that I had seen a quote from, I think, some executive at Lambda School. And basically, he I guess he was trying to explain why Lambda School had all of these instructors that were uh, relatively new to their fields or sometimes unrelated to the fields. Like I heard some stories from Lambda that um, web web developers were checking UX projects. And, and it sounds like this guy tried to explain it away by saying, well, look, you don't need someone with a PhD to teach you how to tie your shoes. You just need someone who already knows how to tie their shoes. And so the True. idea is, right, so the idea is if someone just learned UX <laughs> Six months, a year ago, whether or not they got their first job yet, they know how to tie their shoes. They can teach you. And I think when you combine that from all of the feedback uh, career transitioners and younger people get, like, you don't need college degrees anymore. You know, we you, people are saying, oh, I don't need a college degree. I think this gives people a lot of the wrong messages. Darren, do you need Absolutely. a PhD to teach someone to tie their shoes? And how does that relate to UX? couple things come to mind with that. I love that question. I love that quote. It is an absolute terrible quote and it's deadly. It's deadly to the discipline. It's deadly to anyone with aspirations about the discipline because number one, UX is not tying shoes. Even though people try to make it look like we're tying shoes, we're not tying shoes. Then again, on the other hand, have you ever by chance, a rhetorical question, I've done this, have you ever looked up on Google different ways to tie shoes? That's true. There are many. Amazing. It is absolutely amazing. So, so on one hand, his statement discounts what true UX is, and it lets you know that he's dangerous because you really want to learn how to tie shoes or, or you want to learn about UX from somebody that equates tying shoes with UX. That lets you know your ceiling is if you're going to learn from that individual. Yeah, I, I can. I'm going, to take a step back for, I'm going to take a step back for a moment, Debbie. That's toddlers. That toddlers learn to tie their shoes. Yeah. I don't want to learn UX from toddlers. Exactly. And they're not very good at it. <laughs> I said that I've been doing this full time for 16 years. I didn't say where I've done it. This is another thing that is creating issues and results in the conflict. 16 years of full-time experience and over 75% of my experience is with Fortune 500, Fortune 1000, at least Fortune 500. I've spent a lot of time at the top of the food chain is what I'm getting at. And, and when you work at the top of the food chain, the way that work is done, the way that UX is done, what's expected of UX, the perception of UX and the maturity of UX is completely different that if somebody is going through boot camps and working at jobs, where they're trying to get unicorns in and trying to get you to wear eight hats and things of that nature. And so people are going through that process, whether it's a boot camp or working at a mom and pop shop or being retrofitted into a position that they don't qualify for and then turn and defining UX based on that minuscule point of reference. And then I had somebody one day, I said, hey, you know, we don't go, UXers don't go. I, and I and I gave a list. I gave my history. I worked here. 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 Never one time asked the code because everybody knew it was important for people to stay in their lane. If we're going to actually, I also don't what do visual do. design. Somehow I've worked for over yeah. twenty years without being an artist. Very few UXers, truth be told, are good at visual design. Leave it to the to those people who went to school to make things pretty. They're good at that. It's not our job to make things pretty. But here's the punchline of that story. I tell the person, okay, I did all of this, no coding. And the person stood there, looked me in my eye and said, I disagree. How can you disagree with my experience? I told you what I saw. <laughs> you, can't t you can't disagree with me with what, I, with, with what I saw. You weren't there. You even have, 
I mean, so so it's interesting. The conflicts that exist at the core of these conflicts is this, the this the, the it's like the emperor's new clothes. You're naked, dude, and that's all. We've got some great there, comments a... in uh, LinkedIn that I, I don't want to ignore for too long, even though I know you and no. I have a list of points we were going to hit. Go so Stephen is here. Good to see Stephen. He says, mentorship from a mature senior is critical. I had a manager who acted as a mentor to me. He had worked at Apple yes. near the time of Don Norman, was incredibly important to me as a young uh, and know-it-all junior designer at the time. Uh, Brianna, good to see Brianna here. Haven't seen you in a while. Uh, she she says, junior UX designer here. I actually look up to my senior designers. The hard part is finding someone who has the nice. time and patience to mentor juniors. And and Bianca, you're, you're definitely right. You know, a lot of people come to me and I'm sure they come to Darren and others and say, hey, can you be my mentor? And I go, hey, only so many hours in the day. And so what I've had to do to try to... to I don't know, I don't know the right word for that, manage that, it is I've had to charge a, a nominal amount of money for my time. I say, I'll give you a half hour for $50, and I have almost nobody signing up. And, and my thought is, my time is valuable, my expertise is valuable. I, I'm sorry, I just can't mentor everybody for free. I'd be I'd be talking 12 hours a day. Yes. Uh, one more comment from yeah. Stephen here, and then we'll get back to some of our thoughts. And you guys were live, and and so if you are live on LinkedIn, which evidently people told LinkedIn so, told people that we're uh, alive because we got 11 people watching there, and I think a few a four in YouTube. So hi, um, Stephen also says Udemy courses can also be dangerous. I was listening to a Udemy course yes. where it said the product matter manager did a lot of the deliverables that a UX designer should. Empathy maps, flows, wireframes, and customer feedback, in quotes. So obviously, um, let's let's jump into that, because I think we had that on our list of things we hoped to talk about, which is that, unfortunately, um, juniors and those transitioning into the career do get a wide range of information. They get information uh, sometimes that UX is highly psychological, highly scientific look at human centered design look at HCI get to know Don Norman and then sometimes they get these very surface and shallow things uh, you know UX uh, make an empathy map put some sticky notes on the wall just empathize just just have empathy so I find that that um, that is a source of conflict at all because you and I are yes. coming out and saying, hey, we want to spend proper time and budgeted money on thorough processes with depth and quality. And these other people are coming out and saying, you old dinosaurs with your long, slow, expensive processes, we're just going to do design <laughs> thinking. We're going to do design sprints. We're going to know everything in a week. So... What, what's your response to, to that and some of the differences in what people are, are learning? Well, the first thing is design thinking, we have to be honest. It's key. I'm, and, and Debbie knows I'm a big proponent of, of emotional intelligence in UX spaces. And that means that there is, first and foremost, there's a really high level of self-awareness, which means you're going to face the truth. It might be ugly and it might hurt, but it's going to benefit you, your clients, and the business overall. So that said, number one, design thinking is neither design nor is it thinking. Did you see? Did you see my post that someone just got a certi Someone in my LinkedIn network just got a certificate in design doing. No, that's, Do you want I'm to not die? surprised. <laughs> that that, uh, that people are just so coming up with so many different terms and titles and ways to describe UX. And the thing is, the people that are doing it don't know what they're doing. The problem is because of perception bias and because people have a tendency to believe the first thing they hear instead of subjecting it to critical thinking, it actually fuels all of these false, these false notions. There's no such thing as a UX writer. You apply UX to what the copywriter does, you're done. Save that money to go and spend it, spend it on a, a user testing.com or, or user Zoom license. Don't spend it on uh, uh, unnecessary positions for somebody who's pretty much going to end up twiddling their thumbs in about three months if people are if the operation is working in a healthy manner 
Oh, you're not going to I should say quickly, I am for the UX writer, but I have them utilized in a specific way, and you'd have to read my book to know how. Um, so I just okay. want to say I, I kind of disagree with, uh, with you on there. But anyway, get back to certificates. Certificates. And, and I'll say it, it's without us having the details on that. We're probably saying the same thing. I just say it a different way. But, but the certificates. If you go to a boot camp, if you take courses through, say, uh, the uh, Interaction Design Foundation, uh, IDS, and you get certi a certificate there in taking a course, you do these things. It's really the only thing it's going to do, the only real benefit you're going to get out of that is an introduction to the concept or you're going to further, you already know a little bit, and you're going to further take yourself a little further down the road of, of your knowledge about that particular subject. You're going to expand your circle of competence about that subject. Are you going to learn UX in six months? None of us did. I don't know how you're going to do it. Especially if you're learning from somebody who doesn't know anything. I, I, I got to tell the story in here just to help these people with the, with the boot camp mentality. I was attending a Nielsen Norman conference in DC. And I found out I think it was Career Foundry was next door. And I had been, of course, talking about how this is inappropriate. That's not true. You can't do this. You can't do that. But I'm a fair guy. So I'm going to, I walked in. I literally walked into Career Foundry. Uh, and uh, I think it was them. I don't think it was General Assembly, but whoever it was, it was one of the two. I walk in and I say, and I just told him, hey, you know, I've been talking about you guys for years and this has been my stance. I'd like to hear from you. What is really stance with what you're doing and teaching people about UX. Long story very short, by the time I was walking out about three minutes later, they were trying to sign me up for courses. I told them I was a professor. I told them I had two babies. I told them I've been practicing for X number of years. This has happened like a year and a half or so ago. And they were trying to sign me up. They are so, it is such a, a, a sales I mean, you ever mode. Seen the, Yes. You ever seen the movie The Mummy? The the most recent one and had that thing where this Imhotep guy was around and all the zombies are just following through the streets going Imhotep. That that's what it was. I'm like, come on now. What why are you trying to sell me on something I don't need? Like you're trying to sell me on pants. I have on pants. Why are you what what, what, what is this all about? So when you see something like that, it really calls into question their mode of operation, and it's all about the buck. And I love the comment that one of the people watching mentioned. Uh, we call them MOOCs. I don't even remember what the acronym stands for, but it's an educational venue. Your Coursera, Udemy, um, uh, all of them, uh, edX. These are these are known as MOOCs. There are some subjects, depending upon the subject, that you can get a lot for your your time investment. But when the UX, because the the instructional design isn't appropriate a lot of times, the they have somebody who just teaches it because they just want to make money. We need people who care about the discipline, educating people. And it is a discipline because I had a battle with a lead instructor at a boot camp on LinkedIn some months ago, and he had not worked in UX before, but he had gone to a boot camp the year before and was somehow now the lead instructor. And um, I literally said to him during this battle on in a LinkedIn public conversation, I said, you are part of the problem. And and his, his response was basically like... Um, well, you know, it's easy to teach UX because UX is a mindset. And I think when people hear UX is a mindset, design thinking is a mindset, and then you and I show up w with our, our mortar board and whatever, and we say, well, no, you know, UX is this highly scientific thing. Thing that should take appropriate time. Like, I've got a proposal out to a company where in order to do their research, I want to do 58 interviews with six different categories of people. And I can see a lot of juniors thinking, well, that's 
not what my boot camp taught me. My boot camp taught me go to the mall, find two, three, four people that sound like they might use this. And I mean, we're laughing, but I, I see enough portfolios where the portfolio story yeah. tells me this. And when I push back on these people, they're like, well, the boot camp said, like, you can just go out to a coffee shop and find a few people and talk to them. And it's like, well, no, I'm, I'm going to be doing a very specific project that hopefully I get hired to do this with fi with 58 interviews of six different types of of people and then people go oh you know and even the lean ux book will say well that's you know that takes too long that's expensive and i say no get me and a team of people out there and we can do 56 interviews in two weeks i mean it doesn't have to be one interview a day for two months right right yeah it's pretty sad it, it's it's there's a way i think about lean ux there's a way to do things quickly. You're always going to strategize your UX operation based on what your need is and what your timeline is. So if you're trying to get, if you have a two week sprint, you should be trying to, you don't have to call it lean UX. You're just going to make a commitment, X number of commitments over the course of that sprint. And guess what? Now you're doing lean UX, not the lean UX is being branded. You would heal you in a, in a quick and a lean fashion because you can only do so much in two weeks. It's not rocket science to, to figure that out. However, what you do over the course of that two weeks, sort of thinking about our title again, it's going to differ. What's prescribed is going to differ between a junior and a senior. And we have to wake up about the reality of that. And we have to As wake well. up about what a hiring manager is going to expect. And before I shift into that, I want yeah. to say hi to a couple of European friends joining us. Stephanie's in YouTube and says, ooh, can I also get a certificate in design doing? I'm doing it. I swear. I have to Google it. I'm curious. And I don't know Stephanie that well yet, though I love her posts and everything. I think she'll do it. We're, I'm also happy to see Sophie Fryermuth, uh, even though I probably didn't pronounce that very well. I probably need a more German pronunciation of that um, Freiermut. Um, she says it's easy to teach UX because it's a mindset lol and cry my neck is hurting from <laughs> nodding preach um, so I, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, you know, juniors act like we're dinosaurs. We have old fashioned, slow ways of doing things. They've got lean UX and everybody please watch my podcast on lean UX. I just did it a week or so ago. You can search the channel for lean UX. Um, it's called the lean UX lean UX is neither lean nor UX. Um, so they've got design thinking, they've got design sprints, they've got l things they think are lean, which just really means skimping. And um, But what do hiring managers expect when people come to work for people who've been working in UX? I mean, your typical manager probably has eight or so years. You know, maybe they started here in UX 2010, 2012, way before we were talking about design thinking and design sprints yeah. and the lean. UX book came out in 2016. So that means the person who you hope is your boss was probably raised on a lot of the stuff that you and I do. What's going to happen when that junior goes into that interview and they say, what's your UX process? And they go, just have empathy, then ideate. <laughs> and it's sad that that's what people are branding and expecting when it comes down to applying design, oversimplifying. I like to think of it. I, I used to refer to design thinking when I first heard of it as UX light. That they were only, I jokingly refer to it as that because they're only doing a little bit. The thing is, and, and I'm sort of repeat something I, I already said, you're always going to do what time will allow, what your expertise allows you to bring to the table too. There are, some people can't do certain things because they don't know about them. And so the more that we expand our circle of competence, the more we can potentially prescribed in a given situation, but are we going to, do we want to dumb it down? And I'm just going to say it like that. Do we want to dumb it down to just so supposedly empathizing and just getting everybody on the same page and collaborating? That doesn't, that doesn't give you results. It gives you a thing. And a lot of people have been in this age of participation trophies, sort of referring to kids sports. It's sad that that mentality has made its way into the UX arena, that people are simply participating and they're getting something out. If you code something, something's going to show up. It doesn't mean that it's right. It doesn't mean it's easy to use. It doesn't mean it's the best solution. 
and tested it. Not with three or four people. Mind you, guerrilla guerrilla research has its dangers, and that's one of them. When you conduct research and you have participants, you're supposed to vet participants out. You're supposed to screen participants. So if you just walk into the coffee shop and and have you a product or solution, and you haven't vetted them out to confirm that they meet the qualifications of the right people to look at it, how in the can your solution have value? How can it be optimized? It can't. And, and I fail to mention, I am a PhD student as well. And I love the fact that we throw on and they teach us how to draw more trustworthy, reliable, and actionable data. Everything we do revolves around research. And that, that, that same component, although it belongs to the PhD world, it still resides here in the UX world that trustworthy data, we should be working for that. Reliable I want to, data. oh, sorry, you're, you're blipping a little bit. Oh, um, uh, I, I want to, you know, one point that I like to make, especially it's easy to pick on design thinking, though design sprints are, are now a close cousin. Uh, when I talk about certificates in these things, I ask people, find me a design thinking or design sprint certificate where you were actually judged and assessed on your ability to empathize, judged and assessed on your ability to understand the problem and do the appropriate research <laughs> around the problem, judged, oh, your ideas sucked? Well, then you don't ideate well. You can't have a design thinking certificate. What, your prototype was terrible? No design thinking certificate for you. And finally, testing is step five of design thinking. Let's check your testing plan, your testing participant recruitment, your testing execution, your testing interpretation. Ah, uh, should you get that design thinking certificate? But all of these are just treated, like you said earlier, are you just aware of the process? Are you aware that there's a thing that says there are these five steps, but nobody's checking if you're doing them with any quality or depth. Yep, yep. Pretty sad. Uh, we got a question. And, and I sadly, oh, sorry, go ahead. Then we go got ahead. a question. Oh, you like well, I was just going to say, again, and the conflict comes up because the seniors are more likely because our everybody who's a senior, a true senior experience is on the other side of 2010. And a lot of people being credited as seniors are on the other side of 2015. So we still see that 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 um, that that line, if you will, that variance, and and people need to realize we're going to bring different things to the table, bring diff bring different ideas. Some people choose to fight, but someone else with a healthier mindset would say, "This helps us collaborate. This makes us more diverse." And that's why the seniors are not. We don't want to beat up the juniors. We just want to see the, the juniors grow. Yeah. Again, the conflict, let's have to repeat this and we'll take the question. The conflict should not exist. I was just thinking about the timeline and the years, and I was thinking I got my first senior UX title job in early 2012. I've been senior or higher, and I've bounced around different job set. I'm principal, I'm director, I'm senior again, whatever. I've been senior or higher since 2012. Do you remember when you got a senior title? Mm -hmm. Oh man, it's funny. My first senior title was more a lead. Okay. My first lead That's title was about 2015, okay. 2015, 2016. Uh, but you could not get a senior title even when you had seven years of experience. Today, people are getting senior titles. This is how much the, the UX world has changed. Yeah. I've seen people get senior titles after being a job years. There's no way yeah. a person can be a senior after two years. I saw a person once who has zero experience in CX get a senior title coming through the door and only had a year to a year and a half of UX experience. That That's creating a disparity that causes a problem for all of us because the C-level people are looking at this and they're digesting it based on how their minds tick. And that's a problem for us that we have to manage. 
Yeah, my so, key point was that yeah. you and I and many other people, it's so far from just you and I, have been seniors since before there was a lean UX, before we knew, yes. before there was much of a general assembly, before there were all of yes. these boot camps, before we talked about design thinking. So we've got a couple of questions in the room. I'm going to read a couple first and then circle back to Margaret's questions. So we've got Brianna and okay. Justin. I think they're, so I'm going to read you Justin and then Brianna because they're, they're kind of cousins. Justin says, it's difficult to find UX jobs in an industry that isn't mature. In South Africa, UX is viewed as the output of screens as opposed to understanding the problem and aligning all parties. A lot of UX UI jobs are actually just UI jobs or digital interaction design. And, and I, yeah. I certainly agree. I think that I know a lot yeah. of people who were visual designers and were told, just put UX on your resume and you'll start making more money. And you can just make the same yeah. mock-ups you were making before. You don't even have to learn anything new. You're already mocking up screens, so you'll keep mocking up screens. Yes, unfortunate. That is so unfortunate. And, and that description is dead on accurate. I agree with you, Debbie. And I agree with the person who wrote that. It's really sad. And, 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 and sort of bringing up the conflict thing again, when you take that person and then they meet a me or Debbie on the job, if they do not have emotional intelligence, conflict. the workplace is about to become, it's about to become hostile. Yep. And they assume that somebody wrote me recently on my LinkedIn and, and they said they were intimidated by me. I, uh, yeah, she's here. <laughs> oh, how you doing? So she knows. I'm <laughs> she's like, got a wow. question. <laughs> <laughs> like no, so we but we talked through things and it worked out. But I think, and she can tell you, she's here and she settled down. But I'm like, I'm trying to pull everybody as much as I can, but I can't do it until they recognize that. And the thing that I think about that is, I th when I have empathy, uh, which is constantly, and I think about what this is like for a junior entering this now, I can see how a Debbie and a Darren are scary, are intimidating, uh, could be a little bit yeah, too yeah. loud. I can see that because we have very strong opinions, we're out there, we're really bold, and these people are trying to feel their way around a new industry, and, and we're setting shit on fire. A and so I understand that we can look a little intimidating. Some people are, yeah. are drawn to us, and some people are repelled by us and some just don't know what to do so i definitely understand that and i can empathize because that's what em having empathy is about um but yep. I, I think it's just it, it's if nothing else it speaks to our passion and i'm hoping that today's juniors who hopefully will be tomorrow's seniors though not in one day, um, we'll, we'll catch on to that passion. And what they should take from that is, uh, well, I'm going to be talking about 10 important traits in a UX uh, worker in a couple of weeks in a podcast. And one of them I call lawyer-like skills. And I think that's the thing that you and I have. People say, you argue like a lawyer, you talk like a lawyer, you sound like a lawyer. People are intimidated by lawyers. And, and But I think that to be ultimately long-term successful in UX, there has to be some piece of you that feels a little bit lawyery because you have to be able to stand up to stuff. You have to be resilient to failure or people picking on you or not understanding you. And you've got to keep fighting for that customer. Exactly. And the funny thing about that is I was going to be a lawyer <laughs> at one time. I had somebody clamoring to write my my recommendation letter for me to go to law school. So, And I come and from so, a family I, of I lawyers. All the time. I, I, I come from it's a family of lawyers, here. but I never wanted to be one. But I always feel like I'm kind of one. Let's get back to Brianna's question. So Brianna, thank you for waiting. Yeah. She says, any advice for junior designers looking for work, but discouraged to apply because most job postings are for mid-level designers with three to five years experience. I'm also noting that a lot of companies want you to start as a visual designer before being promoted to UX designer. This happened to me, she says, but my heart is in UX, not UI. So just a couple of quick responses for me and then I'll pass it to Darren. I have not heard about making people start as visual designers before you're allowed to do UX. That is not necessarily a career path just because you're good at visual design doesn't mean you know anything about UX. Um, but I do agree that there are many fewer jobs uh, for juniors right now and that was even pre-pandemic because UX is a mission critical job and employers were finding that many people who were applying for junior jobs 
could not start the job hitting the ground running and they wanted to see that you at least had some experience now it creates snake eating tail how do you get experience when you don't have experience and that's not something we've totally we haven't totally solved yet um, but I do think that that's something we have to solve and, and maybe not necessarily in this podcast, but, um, but I do agree, Brianna, that it's, um, it's a little bit of an impossible situation right now where your first job doesn't want to be your first job. Your first job wants to be your second job after you've cut your teeth somewhere else. Darren, responses to Brianna. Yes. Uh, one of the things that some of you out there may have seen my recent LinkedIn post you're looking for all two of them. You're looking for jobs. A lot of times we get too broad-minded. Uh, I'm guilty too. You, you, you're you looking, you're casting your net for a job and you're looking too broadly. Um, and, and when I say that, what I mean is that you're, you're, we assume that the opportunities or the job postings we out there, that they're, it's like they're all, all created equal or not. So what I'm getting at is, we want to vet out those jobs and really do a good job. Not to mention the fact that people do a terrible job of writing job descriptions. So, so you you never really know until you have an interview, and sometimes you don't know until you get in there that you find out. Okay, this job is as was advertised. But in general, what I'm trying to get at is keep posting, even even if you even if the job stinks. But it looks like it's, it's a stepping stone. Post for it. Yeah, you're, you're, going, you're either going to land something or you're going to get some great experience through that interview or that process that helps make you a better professional going forward. And, and you may not see a lot of junior positions now. It just may be the way that things are flowing. It might be where you're looking uh, it could be because of what's going on from a timeline perspective in the world right now. But just keep plugging away. Because truth be told, it's hard to find a job when you're a senior. Oh, tell me about it. I, I, I come across more junior roles or people that will literally tell you that uh, we're looking for somebody more mid-level. Like, I didn't even hear junior until two years ago. I had never heard junior UX person prior to two years ago. It was all, you want somebody that's getting up and they're in their zero to three-year range and then they wanted somebody more experienced. It was it became the point where it was like three and a half, four years and beyond that. And they were dividing us into two groups unless they were putting you into a leadership role. Today, people would rather corporations have been trying to drive down the salaries of UX for so long and they finally achieved it. So now I think people come out of these boot camps. Who cares if they don't know what because we don't know what UX is anyway? So so when I talked about that broad perspective is that we it, it, it's very narrow in that you're not going to find a lot that works for you so just keep plugging away because a lot of jobs are not what they appear to be a lot of companies don't know what they're doing even companies that you would assume that they do uh, they don't and and it's a sad thing to go to a well-established company and find out that the only thing they know about ux is how to spell literally both sometimes without the <laughs> um, So I want to get back to Margaret's question, and then Sophie, I'm going to get to what you said afterwards. So Margaret says, and I'm going to I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to say what she said. Um, can we talk about UX mature businesses and businesses new to X, UX shaping what expectations of UX is and what it should be in terms of needed experience? And she's really saying we ended up confirming this as I was typing to her: the rise of the unicorn. So we're really talking about how even mature businesses and others seem to be headed towards unicorn land. Uh, and then I'll get, I'll get back to what Sophie posted. So thoughts on unicorn land, Darren? I mean, my observations on unicorns, I'm not sure the timeline that she's referring to with her observations. I think now. And it's not now. It's been like this. That companies have been, most of the unicorns exist at companies that are lower on the U.S. maturity path, companies that are mom and pop shops, startups, uh, you're more because they need somebody to wear multiple hats, so the unicorn more, is more desirable to them. And whereas in, in our world, a unicorn, I, mean, I know someone who delivered a talk once that the unicorn is dead. 
And 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 what from one perspective it is, but because of the needs of organizations, it's not. People are still out there looking for unicorns. Uh, it's it's a it can be a dangerous thing to get into to be in a unicorn position, or it could be a fantastic thing to get into. It depends upon what you bring to the table. And and even if you go into a job like that, you may not remain a unicorn for a long period of time. But over the course of my career, I've worked for Digitas LBI, the largest digital design company in the world. I've worked for the WPP companies. Uh, I have worked in MRM McCann, who's part of Interpublic Group, I believe, is their overarching family. And at no time was anybody ever a unicorn. Why? Because they were well-established and we had a person for every role. If you don't land the position in one of those companies, the, the reality of being called upon to work like a unicorn it's, it's something that could happen. So be ready to deal with it if and when you see it and then ask yourself whether or not you want to work like that. But the reality is it's still a thing, even though it's been ebbing and flowing for a few years. And that, and that ebb and flow, because it's, it's been continuous, I don't see it stopping. You just have to make a decision for yourself. I'm not going anywhere. If they say code, if code is on the job posting and I have an interview, and I will, I might interview with them anyway, and I'll talk to them, and I have. The job I'm in, it was on the job description. And I said, are you expecting me to code? Because to me, the interview was about to end if they said yes. And when they said, no, we just, we just, we for, we didn't get to update our job description. And I breathed a sigh of relief, and we all had a big laugh about it. But reality, the reality, I can't work on information architecture, do research, interaction design, and heuris, uh, heuristics and usability, and code. You're mixing an infinite science with a finite science. Coding is a finite science. UX is an infinite science. All we have to do is change a form factor and we change. The people who are coding are bound by the language. And just because somebody's good at one thing doesn't mean they're good at anything else. I, I remind people, like, I'm yes. an absolutely mediocre to poor artist. Uh, I fancy myself quite good at various aspects of UX, but I am not the person you want doing any visual design, yet your company employs visual designers. So you don't need me to do the visual design. You don't need Margaret to do the visual design. And if Brianna doesn't want to do the visual design, she shouldn't have to, because there are plenty of people exactly. who are fantastic artists who want to do that job it doesn't make sense to combine these jobs but this is possibly a separate podcast so let me jump back into a couple of other things here i know one thing we wanted to talk about uh, when we had put into our notes was the idea of how many juniors and and people who are looking to move into ux seem to be or feel under pressure to uh make themselves look like leaders or make themselves look like thought leaders they're writing all these how-to yeah. articles in medium <laughs> even though they've never done the thing. And Sophie wrote, and this is what reminded me to talk about it. Sophie said she heard from someone who was barely two years in UX, quote, I'm a senior because I lead client workshops. And I saw a portfolio. I, I saw a portfolio from someone who was in a bachelor's degree program. So they haven't even graduated yet. And about three times in the portfolio, it said, I'm a leader. I'm a leader. And at one point it said, because I'm a leader, I convinced everyone to make an empathy map. And my thought was, prove to me that you needed an empathy map. And so exactly. I want to talk a little bit about some of the pressure juniors are under to prematurely look like leaders, as if it's not okay if you're just a junior or a mid-level. I say it's okay. What do, what do you say? I think it's, uh, there's several angles. And any of you who have been connected to me with any period of time uh, are going to be familiar with what I'm about to say. I'm not sure if Debbie knows about this, but I spoke at the UX Strategy Summit in, it was 2015 or 2016, I believe it was. And my topic was about UX functioning as leaders, that UX, the discipline, is a leadership-oriented discipline that no matter what level you're at, you are coming into a leadership-oriented role because of, of the nature of what we do. Now, does that mean that you have a right to go and pick up a mantra and keep and convince yourself that you're a leader? I think not, that that's, that's emotionally immature. Be, just go out and do the job. Uh, if we need, we need to establish a strategy on a project that we're working on, 
you're engaging in a type of leadership and folks need you to be as sound as you can possibly be in order to execute that. But you don't have to go and get a T-shirt or a cap that says you're a leader. You don't have to go and look in the mirror you know, and, and see who is the fairest of them all. You don't have to go through that. Just be Where's my cape? Just be what you <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it's and people are pressuring folks to be leaders because of something that they read or something that they heard. And, and that's not how you produce. One of my favorite leadership books or my favorite leadership book is called Multipliers. And, and, and you don't go out and tell people to fabricate in their mind or imagine that they're a thing. That's not the path to becoming the thing. You have to develop the skill and the knowledge and learn and get good at implementing it. And, and as we get good at implementing the skill and knowledge that we have surrounding the world of UX, you'll be a leader. You don't even have to say it. You never have to say a single solitary thing. You will have a seat at the table and you will be able to execute as such. And they will talk about how much of a leader you are. That word should never come out of your mouth talking about yourself. That's how I feel about that. Yeah, I never say I'm a leader or I'm a thought leader. If someone else says you're a leader, you're a thought leader, I say thank you. But I would never, I think that's the kind yep. of thing you don't say about yourself. And I also think that juniors don't understand, or at least some of these juniors that are trying to look like leaders, don't understand that the definition of a thought leader is the expert to the experts. You know, like Don Norman yeah. is an expert yeah. to experts. Don Norman is beyond thought yeah. leader. If you write an article <laughs> about task analysis painting a room on Medium, you are not a leader or a thought leader. No, no. That's somebody groping for straws. And if you're groping for straws, you're not a leader. That's the blind leading the blind. You don't know where you're going and the people listening to you don't know where you're going. And nobody can tell which way it's because they can't see. So instead, we need to have, we need to be methodical. Examine yourself where you are. I mentioned this a couple times already. Look at your circle of competence. People think they know one thing, but then they really know another. And then there's what you truly have access to. So have a sound, honest assessment about yourself, because that's going to be the basis that allows every last one of us to grow and mature in a way that's beneficial for ourselves and for others. If we do not assess ourselves accurately, then we can't grow. It's going to be stunted and we're going to grow in multiple directions. And we know what that looks like when it's done. So, and we end up turning into a Frankenstein. I don't want to be a Frankenstein. I want to be good at information architecture. I want to be good at use research. It's 18 different, different, I don't want to just run and do a focus group. I want to examine, is the focus group the best thing to do? Or do I need to perform a contextual analysis? Do I need to perform a contextual analysis? Or do I need to engage with full-blown ethnography? What do I need to do? And, and a lot of people don't even know what eth ethnography is, but they just told 50 people that they were good at research. Yeah, and so, um, so. and you're, what you're pointing out now is something I hear a lot from juniors and those transitioning in, which is, well, I feel like I can do some of the UX work, but I really don't get the strategy. I'm not sure which things to do on a project. I wish someone would tell me which things to do. And I say, look, that's going to come over time. If you're in your first couple of years yes. of a UX job, you kind of don't necessarily know what's the right tasks to do, how long those are likely to take, why you would do this task over this this task, like Darren was just saying, do I need full-blown ethnography? Can I do some interviews? What's right here? Focus group, yes, no. And I just tell people, don't worry about that yet. You're, I don't expect strategy from someone until you are senior level. If you have five, six, or yep. more years, I expect you to be strategic about a project. If you are below that, you're not. But I, I don't expect that. But this uh, brings us into some other comments we have here. Uh, quickly, Stephanie's comment, and then Justin has a question. Stephanie said, in my experience, you also get too expensive as a senior for many people, so they'd rather have juniors, but don't understand the junior yep. UX team of one is not a good idea. Stephanie, we know you're right. <laughs> um, very well to hear. <laughs> very true. Uh, Justin has another question. Justin says, I'm not a senior UX designer myself. I have two years of experience. The industry seems to be splitting UX design and UX research. However, I was taught to design and test, as you should. 
do you think designers require a degree in psychology to become a researcher designer, as you see in some job listings? Oh, wow. Uh, the, the direct answer, the short answer is absolutely not. Um, again, degrees of research, pardon the pun, degrees of research. I tried to do my little but, <laughs> rim um, shot, didn't work well. But you're going to grow, and don't be afraid to grow, and growing's not a bad thing. I wanted to make sure to, to point that out. I think Debbie alluded to that a few minutes ago. Don't worry if you're growing. That's, and some companies won't digest it. That's fine. You need to know as an individual, it's okay to grow. But back to the, the degrees. You're going to you're going to find that a lot of people are that we're not agreeing as a discipline about what things are, and it's causing a lot of cloudiness. So if you are, you as an individual, Justin, as an individual, I already hear it in your question, you have an interest in both, so develop. Now you will go to one company, and this is where a lot of people are getting confused, and it gets back to the statement I made about breath. You go to one company, they value the fact that you can bring some research to the table to validate your designs. An opportunity comes up two years from now, you go to another company. That company has people who are dedicated to research and they separate design from research. And you have to make a decision whether or not you're gonna be a designer or a researcher. And so what happens is companies are doing things so differently. It's like Agile. I've, I've worked at Agile at several, several companies and everybody says Agile, but they all do it differently. You have to find out what Agile is when you go to the company. You can't just say, I do Agile, and think it's going to be the same thing. It's not. The same thing is applying to UX. You go from one company to another, the UX maturity level. And if any of you have never looked that up, I did a, a talk, and you can find it on SlideShare, about UX maturity levels. There must be at least 100 different, if I'm just throwing that number out there, UX maturity model or maturity level models out there, we can't say that one fits every company. It doesn't. And so the practice from company to company varies. So just understand that there will be some shifting and, and moving. You have to decide what you want to be and be committed to pursuing that. And, and eventually you hope you find a match between what you bring to the table, because you don't want to go somewhere. I really wanted to do more design. I'm doing all research. Well, check that out when you're looking at the job description. Ask questions about that. What, what you, how you expect your workflow to be split when you go to a company so you can set your expectations and lay a foundation for being at that company for X amount of time. Even though UX years are like dog years, and that's a talk all the time probably, but UX years are like dog years. We got because companies are changing. Yeah, companies are changing too much. Um, so I want to remind everybody, we've only got a few more minutes. Please get your last questions and comments in because then we'll have to wrap up. We try not to go over an hour. And I, and I want to give a quick answer to Justin there. And that is, I don't have a degree in psychology and I didn't do any of the advanced degrees. Darren, you know, wins for advanced degrees uh, out of everybody I know. I've got a bachelor's in music. But when I was in college, I took uh, some psychology classes for fun. Um, it wasn't a minor. It was really just something that I enjoyed and continue to enjoy. And those classes did influence me greatly. So I do recommend to people that whether or not they end up getting a degree in something, it is still absolutely worth studying cognitive psychology, studying human behavior. Yes. These are, you don't have to have a degree in it, and I'm not going to check if you have a degree in it. And hopefully you're not checking for me because I've got a bachelor's in music. But I think it's still important to have studied it because it, uh, even though I only took a few classes in it, it highly influenced my work immediately because in 1995, I wanted to make websites and I literally said to myself, I want to make websites, but I want to make them based on what I just learned in those psychology classes. And I had done psychology yeah. one uh, at my school was one. I had done psychology of music and I had done psychology of language and psychology of language was very much about how people parse information. It was gestalt principles of perception about where people group things or make associations. I was lucky to quite accidentally get some of those foundations that, that really are foundational to, to our industry. I took that class 
for fun and uh, and loved it and then started a web design company and said, how can I use these things I just learned in these psych classes? <laughs> and and so even though I don't have a degree in it, and I, I wouldn't say you have to have a degree in it, but I do tell everyone who asks me, where do I start in UX? I say, start reading psych stuff. Start reading cognitive psych uh, stuff. It can be friendlier books. You know, it doesn't have to be college textbooks, you know, friendlier books as well. Um, and one thing I wanted to end on, and I wanted your opinion on this, um, since we don't have any other questions just yet, but you guys, you've got like one minute left to get it in. Um, one of the main things I see juniors being told or that they tell me that they've been told or that they're trying to do is fake it until you make it. And I think that because that's what they've been told and because that's what they're doing, of course, I know we, we don't agree with this. I think because it's what they've been told and it's and from people they trust yeah. and because it's what they're doing, I think they sometimes look at seniors. And again, this is an area of conflict. They look at Debbie and Darren and go, well, Debbie and Darren probably faked it until they made it so you know they're no different than I am why should I listen to them and I think there's conflict there because people assumed that some of the uh, more senior people around them faked it like they did yeah and I've never faked anything I designed my first website in 1996 and I strove to make sure that it was easy to use and that it was that the content on the site that the navigation was easy to use and that the content was answering the questions that the users had before they asked them. So that way we could reflect their mental models and get it out there. I was already thinking like that in 1996. When I was working on computer-based training and, and trying to make sure that I designed the right solution, I made sure that I tested them. I made sure that they could work properly. I applied the UX principles all the way up to today. No faking it, none of those things. You always find out what you find out where you are. Find out where you want to be and where you need to be and get there and just grow. And as I said, grow, there's nothing wrong with growing. And it's a beautiful thing to recognize that you need to grow because now the challenge is there. So now you just need to find the path. Make yourself better. And the more, the better you make yourself, the more marketable you are, the more success you're going to have. There's and is there a way that, what, that it, Justin asks, is there a way that we can grow if we're in an environment with poor leadership or low UX maturity? Can we still grow in that environment or do we need to move on? No, uh, there's an old, um, there's a process that I learned. And it's funny, I never knew that it had a formal name. Uh, and, and some of my PhD leadership, but I pass it on to people and everything I'm doing and everything I do outside of this is that establish yourself a personal learning network. They call it a PLN for short. You can find stuff about PLNs on the web. Who are who listen to? Who are my good? You know, you got to put Debbie on there. You got to put people like Susan Weinshank on and there. You, you got to put on there. You, you, UX, UX.com is my favorite UX learning resource on the web. And it's all just articles, blog posts. And you establish this where are my sources of information divided by topic and make sure that you are always as an individual, you assign it yourself. You, you always do things to make sure you're growing. I am not going to be restricted in my growth and my maturity by whatever's going on in the company that I work for ever. I never have, I never will. But if you establish a PLN and you're tapping into it, I, I set aside, X amount of time every week to engage with my PLN and make sure that I'm growing, that I'm learning. That I'm, Someone said you blip. What was the site you recommended? You said UX and we heard .com, but we didn't hear if there was something between that. Uh, the UXmatters.com. UX matters, and it does. Okay, great. Uh, my absolute favorite, yes, absolute favorite learning resource on the web. And Scott R. says, design thinking, design doing, design making, design faking. Yeah. He's, he's written us a little poem. Need a, need a thanks, t shirt, Scott. Yeah, thanks for, the, thanks for the poem, Scott. Almost haiku, you know. Um, so anyway, guys, we are so out of time. I want to just do a couple of quick notes. And, of course, thank Darren. As always, I'm sure we'll have you on again, Darren. Everybody loves you, including me. Um, quick notes, guys. Every Tuesday, 6.15 p.m. Italy time is Office Hours Ask Me Anything. Drop by and ask any questions you have about uh, UX, CX, careers, uh, situations, whatever you've got. Um, he says, too 
late. I patented the, the poem. Um, uh, also, uh, Wednesday, our, our podcast this Wednesday, two days from now, if you're watching live, will be Why uh, New Morphism is Bad for Accessibility with Vicki Vo. And we've got lots nice. of great podcasts coming throughout May. I think I'm podcasting twice a week plus office hours. So hopefully this, you'll watch this constellation clearing up and I won't get more <laughs> bug bites on my face. Who wants bug bites on their face? And now, now everybody knows I don't wear makeup because otherwise that would look really nice and, and matte. Um, um, so as <laughs> always, Darren, thank you so much for all of your time and your thanks thoughts and me. your advice for everybody. You're always a treasure. Thanks and everybody. Uh, thanks, everybody. Remember, follow Darren on LinkedIn. Where else can they find you and follow you? I think you've got a YouTube channel and Twitter. There's a YouTube channel coming up, uh, UX Uncensored, uh, where the, there's no topic that we will not touch on. Uh, that's why it's called that. I'm um, in the process of ideating about content. And I think we're going to start out with a bunch of small to, uh, uh, videos just to get that rolling. Uh, I am also part of CXM, which is uh, associated with Michigan State University. And I'm going to be delivering the UX podcast, which I believe begin launching. They begin broadcasting next week. So you can be on the lookout for any CX of M uh, broadcast. And it's called The World of UX. My, my podcast there will be called The World of UX. Uh, and yes, I am on Twitter, uh, UX Uncensored, uh, which you see more UX stuff. And then I'm out there as Aaron Hood. I don't, you're liable to see any and everything under that topic. But you know, UX centered stuff, you'll find it under UX Uncensored. So I'm easy to find. He is. And guys, just a reminder, please subscribe here on YouTube uh, to Delta CX channel. If you can't find it, go to deltacx.tv and it'll redirect you because uh, the YouTube experience is much better than the LinkedIn Live, especially when it doesn't tell LinkedIn yeah. people I'm live. Um, and on that note, I'm going to wrap up. Thanks again to Darren and the fantastic people who joined us today. I think we had almost 20 people uh, joining in live with questions, a super group. Thanks and uh, see everybody soon. Soon. Thanks for watching. Delta CX is available for consulting and projects related to CX and UX strategy, leadership, training, problem finding, problem solving, and innovation. Learn more at deltacx.com.